Good morning. Good morning. Thankful to see everybody this morning. It's good to be here. Uh, we always have, we, we, we talked about all the things that we need to pray for, but we need to remember first and foremost to be thankful that God is gracious and that God is merciful and that even in the difficult times, God is gracious and God is merciful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I always feel like I don't, I told loud enough not to need this, but I turned it on anyway. I, I put several things together this morning and I hope that it'll all come together when I tell it to you like it did in my head and that it'll all make sense when we get to the end of this. I read a story that said when we first bought our property, we leased the pasture land back to the original owner for two or three years so his cows could stay on the land. There were cow trails all over the place. But when he sold off that set of cows and the pasture land sat for a couple of years, all the trails disappeared. When we rebuilt the fencing and got, the cow and got cows of our own, the trails began to reappear in all the exact same places. My cows had never met his cows. It just happened organically. The new cows needed the same shade, the same food, and the same water as the old cows. And it turns out those old trails really were the best way to get to all of those things. Both sets of cows instinctively knew the best way to find the water, the shade, and the green pastures they needed to survive. Last night we were trying to find something to watch on TV and Joseph found this documentary and it was about coastal uh, sea life, dolphins and sharks and whales and coral reefs and all the different uh, ways that animals find food, their food and how they live and how they survive in the water. And the dolphins would all get together and it's like they instinctively knew how to create this swarm of mud and the fish would start jumping up in the air and the dolphins would catch them and that's how they would get their food. And then it talked about sea otters and sea lions and whales and how they all work together as a group to find their food and to survive. And I was kind of amazed as we watched it that God knew all of this in his design. The cows would know how to get to the shade and the water. The fish would know how to work together to find their food. You've probably heard of when somebody does something foolish, like I tell this to the boys when they were little, you silly goose. I can tell you that geese are not really silly and we can learn a lot from them. The, the geese fly in a V formation. And they fly this way. Studies have given us the answer. It has been learned that as each goose flaps its wings, it gives lift to the one immediately following behind. It has been determined that flying this way gives the geese about 70% more flying range. That means that the lead goose is working a little harder. And when it gets tired, it falls back into the formation and another goose takes its place. If you've ever seen a flock of geese flying, you also notice that all the time they are flying, they are honking. They do this to encourage one another. It's always easier to do something difficult when you know that you aren't doing it alone. If a goose becomes sick or injured, it falls to the ground, and when that happens, two other geese go down to stay with it until it is well. And after it's well, they rejoin the formation and continue on the journey. What lessons can we learn from all of these animals? The scripture I have is Romans 12, 6 through 8. We all have different gifts according to the grace given us. 
If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. These animals can teach us that it is important for all church members to share the responsibility within the church, that we could learn that it is important to give encouragement to others and work in the church. We can learn that it's important to care for other people when they're sick, to stay with them until they're better. We learn it's important for us to look after those who are in need, and we learn to support each other. And most importantly, we learn to follow God's path to the water, shade, and pastures. And certainly, Sister Rachel has given us some beautiful examples of that today. We say that God rules, and yet sometimes we try to put boxes around where his rule is. That he rules in our hearts, but that he kind of lets the world go and do its own thing. That blessings are spiritual and that the natural realm is still kind of left in our hands and, and you know, that it's, that it's entirely up to us how well we do. And, and uh, I want to remind you this morning before I try to take a text that God is a spirit. And he seeketh such to worship him as worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Therefore, I would have to say that everything that flows from God has a spiritual root. And if you believe that the blessings that you have received in life even those natural benefits that you have received in life, that God had a hand in it, I want you to know this morning that they are spiritual blessings because they come from a spiritual God and he deserves our spiritual thanksgiving for those things and our spiritual trust in him to continue to provide as seems good in his sight. <clears throat> that doesn't always mean we're going to get what we want. It doesn't always mean we're going to keep what we have. But God is still God. As believers, this is something that we need to latch on to hard and fast, that God is still God. If we stumble... God's still God. David confessed that his house had not always been faithful to God. But in the same breath, he confessed that God had always been faithful to his house. Thankfully, God's faithfulness to us is not reciprocal based on our faithfulness to him. God is always faithful. God is always true. God has a storehouse filled with mercy. And no matter how much we might draw from that, no matter how much he might send out from that, that storehouse is always full. There's always a sufficiency there for the needs of his people. Just like the oil and the flour that never gave out by seeking God first. We might you turn this morning for just a little while to the 49th chapter of the book of Genesis. 
least it's an easy book to find, right? You don't have to don't have to try to dig around in the middle for some of them that's only two or three pages thick. And in the 49th chapter of Genesis, we find <coughs> Israel or Jacob speaking concerning each of his sons. And I'm sure that there's much that we can learn from all of them. But I want to call your attention particularly this morning to the beginning of the 22nd verse. To the blessing that he had for Joseph. Or what he had to say about Joseph. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors under the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Now certainly there are clear applications of this to the life of Joseph. His brothers hated him. He had a, he had a goal and a vision and, and, and a dream, if you will, that superseded their thoughts. His father loved him. They were jealous of him. Jealous of him to the extent that they hated Joseph. They couldn't, according to the scripture, they couldn't think one kind thought toward Joseph. So deep-rooted was their hate for their brother. Because he wasn't quite like them. He was separate from them. His father loved him. He had a special coat that he wore that made him recognizable from great distances. He had dreams and visions, and, and, and those dreams and visions and the things that he taught from those things, they weren't always pleasing to his brothers. Because in them, his brothers were shown to bow to him and to honor him and to worship him and, and, and that that just didn't, didn't sit well at all. <coughs> I expect Sam and Brandon to have a little bit of a problem bowing down at Robbie Steve. See, that's just not our nature, is it? And yet this was what Joseph told his brothers from two different drinks. They were so angry with him that they were ready to kill him. Plotted and planned to kill him. Had already decided how they were going to go about killing him. And then how they were going to try to deceive their father into thinking that Joseph had been killed by some wild beast and drug off into the wilderness. Now Reuben wasn't quite as hard-hearted as his brother. And I don't know that it was so much that he thought more of Joseph than the others did or that he had a little more concern for what that would do to his father and his mother than Joseph, than, than the others did. But at any rate, he plotted with them to just leave him in a pit out in the wilderness. He found the hole out there. He was going to drop him in it and leave him. Following would still with the thought and the intent that, you know, he'd die there. If he, if he didn't get out of the hole, he'd die of thirst and starvation. And if he did, why, well, some wild beast sure enough might eat him. But then there just happened to come a, a, a caravan of slave traders. Isn't it amazing? 
amazing how many coincidences there are in the Bible. And so his brothers got this big idea of let's just sell him. Let's sell him to these slavers. Let's sell him to these slavers for 20 pieces of silver. And so then Joseph really was separate from his brethren. He was carried into a land that was not his by nativity. He was carried into a land where he was a stranger, where he was treated as a prisoner, where he was, again, despised. I mean, there, there were seasons where that, that he prospered and then he was despised and rejected over and over again until at this time of great prosperity came in his life. And all the things that he had perceived in his brethren came to pass. So many parallels to the story of Joseph and to our Lord Jesus Christ. But in this, Joseph is a fruitful bough, or a fruitful vine. Most kind of we think of bough, we think of a limb off of a tree. But I think this literally was translated as a vine. He was a fruitful vine, even a fruitful vine by a well whose branches run over the wall. Well, now, we all know that things that are, uh, that are planted close to a good water source grow better than things that are, don't, don't they? They don't have to be, they, they, they just by na nature do better if they're planted close to a water source. If there's always water readily and available and, and, and for them to grow and to be fruitful. I want you to know that our Lord and Redeemer was always fruitful. That he was always, I believe we can safely say that he was always in communion with his father day in and day out even while he lived here in the body of flesh he even testified of himself that he said the, the words that I speak unto you are the things I've heard from my father and the deeds that I do are the things that I've seen my father do Jesus witnessed himself that everything that he did was because of his communion with the father and then in another place he even said I can of mine own self do nothing. It is the Father that doeth the works. That, it has always amazed me. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Jesus said, I can't do anything on my own. That comes from the Father. Apparently, we've got a lot of folks in this world that think they're better than Jesus. Because we begin to think about things that we can do on our own. Things that we can accomplish on our own. Ways that we can do things on our own to bring ourselves into favor with God. If the only begotten Son of God declared, I can do nothing of myself, I don't know where we ever got the idea that there was anything that we could do. Not on our own. But that award is a fruitful and his children know that well because we by God's grace and mercy are partakers of that fruit every day of our lives partakers of his peace of his love of his joy of his comfort of his encouragement of his reproof and his rebuke we are partakers of all that he bears because he has called us and caused us to be so. And he is not confined. I, I love this picture. A fruitful vow by a well whose branches run over the wall. One place that I lived, we had some neighbors that had some marvelous peach trees. And I enjoyed many a peach off of those trees. Didn't even have to go to my neighbor's yard to get them. They were planted close to the fence. And some of them, some of them hung over on my side. And they, they assured me it was all right to help myself. I didn't just, I didn't just go get them. But it was, it was a wonderful thing to be able to walk out in my backyard and gather fruit off of something I didn't plant and didn't tend. And it was good. Your Redeemer, your Lord and Savior is a fruitful bough. Planted by, planted by a well of living water. 
and his branches run over the wall. He is not confined by anything or any design of men. He is not confined by the place where he started. He was not confined by the fact that he was of the tribe of Judah. He was not confined by, by the fact that, that he naturally and physically was a Jew when he came into this world. He was not confined by the law that prohibited the Gentiles from participating in the covenant of Almighty God. He fulfilled that law, yes. He told his disciples, while he was still here in the body of flesh, don't you go but anywhere but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But you see, the day came that he made it manifest that his bowels ran over that wall. And he told them to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Men all through the years have taken a lot of shots at Jesus, haven't they? I remember in my younger years, somebody writing a book called The Passover Plot. And the theory behind that book was that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. That when it talks about them raising that sponge with, with, with the hyssop and the vinegar when he said, I thirst. And, and, and instead of giving him water, they put a sponge to his mouth with this astringent in it to increase his suffering. That really what they were doing, that they, that they had slipped something in there to knock him out. That they had anesthetized him, basically. Made him appear as dead. That, that, that he didn't really die. about conspiracy theories going wild. Jesus was hated by the very people that should have adored him. Hated by his own. Hated by those that were his. Hated by his brothers. And made separate from them. And it's easy for us to say, well, I've never hated Jesus. I've never taken a shot at Jesus. But every time that we have thought that we were sufficient of ourselves, we have despised our need for our redeemer. And it is of his great mercy and of his wonderful fruitfulness that we find that mercy continually bestowed upon us, that forgiveness continually there to comfort us. And, and understand, I'm, I, I, I know when Jesus forgives us, we're forgiven. I don't have to go back and get forgiveness over and over and over again as far as the actuality of being forgiven is concerned. But isn't it wonderful that every time that my heart yearns for that feeling that he is merciful and assures me again of his forgiveness, of his love, of his kindness, of his mercy. They shot at him and hated him. And the world today still shoots at him and hates him. The world hates kindness. And if you doubt that, all you've got to do is, is, is turn on Fox or CNN for a few minutes, <coughs> and it won't take them long to show you that the world hates kindness. What they are never going to show you is the abundant kindness that the Lord of glory still sheds into the hearts of his people and that is, a, 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 that is displayed and shown in this world in spite of everything that they would have you to believe. But they don't want you to believe in God's mercy. They don't want you to believe in God's grace. They want you to cower in fear because that makes you easy to control. Your Redeemer is a fruitful back.
His bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Remember Jesus said, I can't of my own self do nothing. It is the Father that doeth the works. We, we find that very testimony right here in Genesis. His bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. From where? From the mighty God of Jacob. Not from Jacob, but from the mighty God of Jacob, the stone which the builders rejected, which is made the head of the corner, and the shepherd of their souls, the Lord is my shepherd, David said. That shepherd has come from the mighty God of Jacob. Do you know how you know that God loves you? Because Jesus loves you. <coughs> now, I, 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 I continually encounter people that see Jesus as being kind and merciful and God as being angry and vengeful. <coughs> Do you understand this morning, brothers and sisters, that the scripture says that everything that we know about God, we know because of Jesus that we know because of Jesus. That we see the attributes of God in Jesus. If you see love and mercy and grace in Jesus, that is the love and the mercy and the grace of God because, again, Jesus said, I do what I've seen my Father do. And I tell you what I've heard my Father say. Even by the God of thy Father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessings of thy Father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Jacob said to Joseph, the blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of my progenitors. You see, I think, again, he was, he was pointing here to God as that father. And he was saying that the blessings of the father were, were, were greater than, than all the blessings of that Jacob had enjoyed, all the fruits that he had been blessed with, that, that, that Jesus, that the blessings in Jesus Christ are far greater than anything that we have ever done or ever known or ever deserved or ever desired <coughs> on our own. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was sick from his breath. So many ways that Jesus was sick. He left the land of eternal glory. Some place that you and I have not yet been. And he took upon himself the form of man. Something that you and I are born with. He took it upon himself. And though he was verily man, he was also verily God, and therefore separate from his brethren. And 
while none of his brethren could ever claim, while none of we, his brethren, could ever claim that we have suffered unjustly being righteous and suffering as sinners, he was separate from us in that he was righteous and suffered for all sin. separate because whereas we could not endure the judgment of the Father he did separate because whereas I could not bear the weight of my own sin he took upon himself the weight of all the sins of all of his people throughout all time and bore them before him the throne of Almighty God. And endured the Father, turning his face from him. I know there have been times in all of our lives whenever we, like David, we've asked the Lord, are you clean gone forever? There have been times in our lives that we've felt ourselves to be forsaken, felt ourselves to be abandoned, maybe had the thought run to or through our head that, that maybe God didn't love us anymore. But way down deep in our soul, there was an anchor that refused to let that just completely overtake our lives, wasn't it? Because I'm going to tell you something. If I truly thought for a minute that God didn't love me, I see no point in continuing to draw breath. It's just that simple for me. There may have been times in my life that I thought that, that he's just gone. He just he's turned away from me. But I couldn't harbor that long because I couldn't reconcile it with the scripture that says that he'd never leave me or forsake me. But I also know the scripture says that he cannot look upon sin. And when his only begotten son gathered unto himself our sins and was made to cry from that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that moment, all of our sins were his. And his alone. And he endured the judgment for all of those sins, him and him alone. Aren't you thankful that those weren't the last words that he uttered from that cross? He says, as far as I can find and as far as I can recall from the scriptures, the only time that Jesus ever failed to refer to the Father as Father was in that moment on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? but I am sure that it was finished not only by the words that he said it is finished, but because when he declared it to be finished, he said, Father, not God, but Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. <clears throat> Separate from his brethren. I could never in my own strength commend my spirit unto God. But in the strength of my brother, who praised God, was separate from me. Just as he commended his spirit unto the Father, so my spirit and your spirit is commended unto the Father. And that just as surely as the life that God had given his son 
in that moment went back to the Father that gave it. It's just that certain that when we have come to the end of our journey that the life that God has given us will return to God who gave it. And if time is still going on, these old frames will await the morning of the resurrection. Joseph is a fruitful bough. And he is not confined by the faults of his enemies, the designs of those who hate him, or the faults and the failures, even of those who love him. He is a fruitful bough. His branches have run over the wall. Just in spite of all of it, let's face it, if men had their way, we would never have had the opportunity to be Christians. Because if men had had their way, that that we call Christianity would have been destroyed. But Jesus is dead. They could not destroy it then. They have not been able to destroy it since then. And I am persuaded by God's word that the day will never come when they will destroy it. I believe God still reserves to himself those that have never bowed the knee to the things of this world and the designs of men that would tell them that Joseph is not worth their love. Isn't it marvelous that even in those that, that we call the Old Testament, and there are many that will tell you that there's nothing in the Old Testament that the New Testament church needs to know about. But I'm going to tell you that my soul needed to know that Joseph was a fruitful bough. And that his branches ran over the wall. That he is not confined, that he is not defeated, and that he is still my Redeemer. And while when he came, and as he endured all of that, and even, even today to such extent that he is separate from his brethren, <laughs> that by his own grace and his own mercy and his own design, he has even destroyed that separation. He said, I am the Father. And the Father in me, and I in you, and you in me. Now, I, I don't know. I don't see. I don't know where you can see any separation in that anymore. I can't. We are in Him. By God's grace and mercy, and He is in us by the authority of God and according to the will of God. And the Scripture says that we are joined heirs. that we are in possession of everything that is his. I hope that you will find a blessing and an encouragement in these words to know that he was always purposed to be and has always been the good shepherd in the head of the corner and that he will not forsake his sheep and he will not be moved from that holy place. May God bless and keep you tonight.